Well, hello and welcome to The Order of Unmanageable Risks, a podcast about capitalism and anxiety. My name is Aris Komporosa Satanasiu, and I'm an Associate Professor of Sociology at University College London. And my name is Max Haven, and I'm Canada Research Chair in Culture, Media and Social Justice at Lakehead University in Thunder Bay, Canada. On this show, The Order of Unmanageable Risks, we call up someone whose research or writing has inspired us to think differently about capitalism and society. We are seeking to go beyond medical approaches to mental health and explore the way that an economic system both produces and relies on anxiety. This podcast is produced by the Common Anxieties Research Project with the support of University College of London's Institute for Advanced Study and the Reimagining Value Action Lab. For more information, you can visit us at anxious.community online. And on this episode, we're delighted to be joined by Jameson Webster. Welcome, Jameson. Thank you. Uh, Jameson is a psychoanalyst in New York and teaches at the New School for Social Research. She has written uh, many articles and books, uh, amongst which recently, more recently, on psychoanalysis for the New York Review of Books and Conversion Disorder by Columbia University Press in 2018. Um, so Jameson has written uh, very beautifully about um, a, a very eclectic writer for various uh, topics, but I have really enjoyed um, her recent writing on uh, current social and political events from the perspective of an analyst. And I think what I, what I personally find really um, fascinating in the way that um, uh, you write, Jameson, is uh, the way you also write yourself into the narrative um, and uh, I think, especially in the times that we live in, which are rather chaotic and uncertain and very strange, I think there is a degree of um, sort of poetic strangeness as well in, in some of your own writing that I think engages quite head on with that, with that reality that sort of surrounds us. So um, let me just start with a question that addresses the, the topic of our podcast and I think a lot of your thinking and writing which is the state of anxiety, of collective anxiety today in in the current circumstances, um, especially in the US context that I know you're experiencing more closely. Um, So your thoughts around what makes this current anxiety different to the past? I mean, the, the beginning of the conversion book strangely veered into a question of anxiety, which I, I take up later, but, um, What surprised me was in thinking about patients' unwell bodies, because that was the kind of basis of it, this idea that everyone feels a bit sick (laughs) in in late stage capitalism, Um, you know, how to kind of mesh this with some of the original Freudian ideas. And that anxiety is the real kind of root of a problem here in relationship between the patient and their body. Um, And it was one that was very important to Freud because he had this idea of um, you kind of like a bifurcated choice. Either you have a symptom, which might allow you to live, but by which you suffer from it, whatever it might be. I mean, it could be kind of psychosomatic problems. It could be obsessional rituals. It could be compulsions. It could be a phobia, or you have anxiety. Mm-hmm. And the problem with anxiety was anxiety prevents the symptom from forming. And he had this real question about whether anxiety was analyzable or what it would take to make anxiety into something analyzable, which means to give it some content. Because the problem with anxiety is it's so diffuse, you know, it can latch onto anything, it kind of moves around. Um, and I, you know, I really kind of experienced the, the deadening <laughs> of treatment by virtue of everyone's anxiety. And it felt like the real pain that I suffered as an analyst was in relationship to this problem of like more and more and more anxiety. Mm-hmm. Um, and the problem with anxiety, which is also something that we see now in the pandemic, is that it feeds off of itself and it makes itself worse without any end. I mean, that's also the experience of it is the endlessness of it and the experience of without a limit. Um, and so to make a, pra- a patient break out of this is really difficult. Um, it's not someone who comes and speaks about their life. It's really having to force the person out of 
the anxiety. Um, which is why I imagine other treatments, for example, like CBT and like mindfulness and meditation are a lot of what helps these patients more than psychoanalysis at certain points in time, because at least it's just trying to kind of knock them out of the anxiety, um, as opposed to analysis, which needs the anxiety to be something else than what it is in order to, to analyze them. So um, I was sort of playing around in this space in the, in the kind of beginning of the book. Um, and I was also kind of fascinated by Freud. I don't know if you know, but his early, early, early theory of anxiety was that it was caused by failed orgasms. This is like early in the day, Freud. So the problem is like your, your orgasm is trapped inside of you. <laughs> There's no way out. And, you know, this is like a kind of stupid early Freudianism that all Freudians make fun of at this point in time, and it's defunct. But I, I ran across this comment by Jacques Lacan, who said that this is the most brilliant interpretation by Freud ever. And so I was like, what, what is he talking about? I mean, this is a joke. And Lacan went on to say that what Freud meant in saying that it was a failed orgasm was saying that our expectation in that moment for satisfaction, for unity with the other, when it's disappointed, anxiety erupts. So it's in relationship to the collapse of a fantasy that anxiety appears, which he says was what Freud was saying, but didn't understand that he was saying early in the day which is why he said it was completely brilliant. It's exactly the right interpretation of anxiety, actually. So anxiety is a result of coitus interruptus, but the problem is that the coitus is the interruptus of the fantasy. <laughs> um, so I sort of loved, I sort of loved this um, strange anachronism. So what, I, I just want to ask you to kind of carry that through to thinking about being in a very anxious shared moment and this idea that especially in the pandemic, but even before the pandemic, all of the fantasies of neoliberal capitalism seem to have been interrupted by neoliberal capitalism itself, perhaps. Mm -hmm. um, is, is that kind of, yeah, is that, is that kind of your part of the analysis of the current moment? Yeah, I mean, if I, would, if I would push this into now, I'd say that this is an amazing moment in which I think people's fantasies that had held them together are, collapsing for the better and for the worse. So the question is if we can make it to the other side of this anxiety towards some new content. You know, so a lot of the thinking that's going on right now is about, you know, can we find the capacity to imagine something else than the world that we thought that we had but don't have? Um, and that that takes real courage. And, and, and it's a question of the courage of weathering anxiety, I think. Um, and the problem of all of the ways in which neoliberalism is cashing in on our anxiety, which allows it never to kind of push towards imagine, you know, towards imagination, I would say. And then I guess on the other side of that, coming on the other side of this kind of more liberating moment or, or you know, this reimagining, moment of reimagining, um, if, we, if we think about where this might be taking place uh, pol politically today, it seems to me that we see more of that reimagining, not for the better, in a more sinister way, taking place on the right. And, you know, this um, seems to me that this kind of world occupied by conspiracy theorists and, you know, Trump politics does something quite interesting with um, engaging with this, uh, with this world, this anxious world. Um, and I'm wondering if you have any, any thoughts on, on how on, on this phenomenon? I mean, the, the Biden campaign, you know, build back better, I don't even know what that means, but, um, <laughs> you know, it, 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 they're, they're playing with, on the one hand, they don't, they understand that going back to status quo is not entirely what you want to put forward at the same time that they can't entirely not put it forward because they need to capture a certain amount of people who need that fantasy that we're just going to go back to the status quo. Um, so this is really the problem on the left is being pulled towards the middle and being pulled towards the left that doesn't, you know, that wants just out of, of um, you know, what history has put on its shoulders. Um, the, the Make America Great Again um, was incredible because it, you know, it posits the fantasy that we were great and that, that they're going to give it back to us. So, I mean, you can imagine what, you know, how this serves on a platter to certain people who 
um, really feel crushed uh, in this country. Um, you know, it's something for them to shore themselves up. Um, I, you know, I, I think though the, that it's fascinating to me. I mean, I, I don't know what's going to happen in this election and we're all like crawling to November 3rd, um, but that it's not going to work again. I mean, that's, that, that's a really fascinating prospect, if, if that turns out to be true, that, that it's something that you can only sell to people once um, and, you know, sell to their anxiety. Because I, I think that that's true, that part of the thing with anxiety is that it searches for something, but it has to keep going. And so you, you can't do it again. <laughs> I wonder, um, I want to come back to that theme. It's so fascinating about the kind of the, the way that anxiety can con constantly searches for this kind of object that it, but I wanted to ask you just while we're on the topic of the elections um, about the strange way in the last few years, and you wrote about this even before Donald Trump was elected the first time, that there's a weird fragments of psychoanalytic language have made themselves available <laughs> to popular and political discourse in strange ways. So there's this been this, this real push, both by um, psychiatric professionals and by uh, non-professionals to kind of try and psychoanalyze Trump, but also to apply this language in some way to all aspects of uh, political life now, including the kinds of paranoia. I mean, our own work in terms of trying to attribute anxiety to be a feature of the system. Uh, what, what do you make of that? Does that? Do you think that that's a good use of these terminologies or do you think that in a way it, it it does a disservice to them and to the complexities of the situation. Oh, it's so amazing. I mean, the, I talked to, I, I, I've talked a bit at different points in time about the identification with being mentally ill um, and how celebrated it is. I mean, especially online, these communities where you find your like mentally ill brethren and um, you know, like you could like here's the anxious people and here's the obsessional people and here's the people with this symptom. I mean, it's like dating apps where you go find <laughs> like with like. And I don't know how I feel about it. I mean, one, you know, I, I my version of psychoanalysis is not one where diagnosis and labels and reading into something is the way that psychoanalysis works clinically. Um, and it's something that like, you know, it's like the, the medical students disease, the first year of medical school, you have every single disease that you read about. I mean, this is something that you're supposed to get over as an analyst. It's very exciting to analyze everybody around you. But once you've been conducting treatments, it does not work like this. It's not on the order of understanding. Um, you know, I mean, it's not that there's not plenty of analysts who make this mistake. But it's funny because it's the public making the kind of naive psychoanalytic mistake, which is fine, however, because it creates a transference to analysis. There's something that they want to know that they then have to come speak to you and find out that it has nothing to do with what you understand about them, but what they have to say and how the act of speaking itself is actually radically transformative. Right, so the problem, I guess, if you think about the discourse in the world is that will this discoursing in a psychoanalytic mode or about mental health bring about a kind of change? It's not gonna be the change that the understanding it itself provides, but maybe it makes something happen. I don't know. I mean, this is where it's very hard for me as a clinician to speak collectively and not on what I do, which is like a person by person basis. Um, but, you know, part of what I, I hear is just the desire for change, which they think these labels, <laughs> these diagnostic indicators are going to help them find. Um, you know, and Trump too, I mean, it's amazing because you, you wind up in the strange conundrums of analysis where he's every single thing. He's a narcissist. He's a psychopath. He's psychotic. He's a megalomaniac. He's, you know, melancholically depressed. He's obsessed with his mother. He has an incest problem with his daughter. He's a pervert. I mean, he's every single thing, which just makes him a kind of like green screen for our own questions about what it means to be a subject. Um, you know, and fine, let's have the question. The problem is none of the answers are gonna suffice. <laughs> It was funny that article from um, The Guardian that I wrote before he got elected because they wanted me to do a psychoanalysis of Trump. Um, and I refused to do it 
as you saw, and I like spoke more about what it means to try to psychoanalyze Trump. Um, and, and they were really unhappy with me and never asked me to write again <laughs> for the Guardian. <laughs> Is that right? Because, because I think, I think you really actually, uh, it, it was a very, uh, it was prophetic as well. I mean, I think what you were, if I remember what you, you mentioned about how he has become this master of a spectacle. And these were really the very early days where, you know, we haven't seen much of it actually, what, you know, him being in power and being part of that spectacle. Um, and I was, I was actually thinking about that earlier, that you say that um, it's a sort of a, a, a dance macabre and uh, it's sort of, it, it, it all, it's, you talk about the sort of, um, that it's, it's, it's all going to lead in a big fire and, and it, but obviously it hasn't quite led to that. I mean, in some ways it has, but I, I mean, I, I'm wondering how you thought of that spectacle uh, throughout that presidency and where, where we are with that spectacle now? Um, I mean, the, nothing has been more spectacular, I think, than the last couple of weeks with the sort of image machine around the question of his survival of COVID, which I actually think isn't working. I think it's so unbelievably unhinged that people um, find that it like flies in the reality of the, pace, in the face of real sickness and death. Right. I mean, if you're going to play a game with death, you have to be very, very careful. Um, and if you put too many kind of veils around it, you're going to end up looking like a fool. So he really made the wrong wager at this level, I think, at, at this point. Um, I was also fascinated with the fact that something contingent finally broke the spectacle. You had the fly on Pence's head during the debate and you had the reality of COVID, which you know, no one could have planned for. So these things kind of finally attacked the spectacular machinery of the Trump administration, which made me very happy as an analyst because it's also what you wait for as an analyst is something to, to break it that you can't account for, right? That you can't kind of see in advance and understand and like put into its own machinery of production. So I was very happy about that. Um, you know, the, the idea of Trump as a kind of Nero who's going to be unhinged by his own spectacle was just a kind of um, prediction on my part, but a prediction based on the idea that, you know, psychoanalysis says that a fear of breakdown, like if you fear something that's going to happen to you, it's, our, it's already happened. Right? So it, like whatever you're fearing in the future is really about the return of the repressed, something in the past that's then going to catch up with you and repeat and it's going to unravel you. So it was a very basic idea that this Make America Great Again was going to become something that forces the repressed to manifest itself in the present, um, which was that he was going to, he was going to, he was going to bring himself down somehow. I mean, potentially with everyone, all of us going with him, <laughs> which is the problem. I mean, I wonder, thinking from that perspective of of we're in a position now where whether Trump wins or loses, the in some ways the ideological damage uh, has been done in a very grave way. I mean, just on the on the very surface level, the symptom of uh, rising far right paramilitaries, revanchist racism is a specter not only haunting the United States but the world. Presuming that at some point he does get unseated from power, how does a society, from, from your perspective, how, how do you begin the process of what these days we like to call healing or transformation at least? How, you know, I, I'm thinking about this in terms of what you were just saying about, about the, the way in which anxiety always looks for its next sort of alibi or excuse to perpetuate itself. How, how do you actually, um, both with a patient and with society, approach that kind of transformative moment that could actually mean substantial change and a reckoning with those demons? I mean, I did, a, I did an interview recently with the philosopher Paul Preciado um, for a, a supplement to Gagosian magazine. And, um, he was very optimistic. He said that um, he thought that America finally had a history. It was a little bit European patronizing, which he admitted, you know, like, oh, you Americans, finally you have a history. But I also think that there's something right about it. <laughs> Insofar as you do have a sense not only of the historical nature of this moment, but the historical nature of this moment bringing in a kind of 
history of what it means to be American in the positive and negative sense um, and the reckoning with it. So, I mean, in the best of all possible worlds, there's healing just by virtue of that. That's what the return of the repressed does. Um, and it makes us have to find the way forward and we can't kind of blind ourselves to this. At the same time that I don't have huge faith in the democratic party or the political machinery. And I think that you're right, that it's the institutions are also um, in tatters here. So what is going to build any structure that's going to allow us to move forward, given the fact that the structures are as leveled, I think, as they are? I don't know. Um, but I do, I do think that there's possibility um, there. It's just not clear to me um, where the organizing forces are going to come from. We also have to build back a relationship to speech. I mean, it's just screaming and yelling and arguing in this country at this point, online and on the TV, as we saw with the debates. And um, I don't know how we speak. <laughs> I think it's amazing that Biden has a stutter, that that's the question of Biden, is one, this man, the one man who like vomits everything out of his mouth and the other one who, who struggles with the inhibition of speech. Um, yeah. Can, can I jump in here? Because talking about speech, and I was wondering about the ways in which speech, but also image, are mediated in this kind of spectacle that we were talking about earlier, um, the, the political spectacle, I mean, but also the everyday spe the spectacle, the spectacle of everyday life. And um, there is, I, I feel that there's certainly something very fragmented and disorienting in the way we uh, our everyday engagements with social media and uh, various apps um, kind of uh, contribute and compound that element of disorientation and fragmentation. And of course, speech itself takes a different form through those through those media. And, and I want I mean, I know that you also, you know, you 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 use some of that those media and you know, you have a presence online and and I also, I've read in one of your recent essays, you were talking about how even the, the mediation um, between patient, how the, the pandemic and how it has changed the, the relationship between, uh, with your patients and also the, this volunteering work that you were doing in, in the hospital and how you, how you were bringing families and patients together through mobile phones, if I remember right so there is something about the role of media that i think is really interesting and it's changing and it does something to the what we would have perceived as clarity of speech and 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 so i'm just wondering what your thoughts are around these the way that, of, of, about this change i mean there's something strange which is that very very young patients of mine let's say like in their 20s are so fast I mean, you know, there, there's lots of talk about this at the level of which they process information, but just they're like so fast and they're quick with their own image of themselves and playing with it. And um, I mean, I just like, I think of myself at that age and I was like an idiot. I had no, you know, I, I didn't understand anything and I didn't understand my place in the world. I mean, they, they're, they're so placed and so malleable at the same time and they're hyper professionalized. I mean, it took me years to figure out how to even sound like a professional person. And I'm really surprised at how quick they like put this package together. Um, so on the one hand, there is all this fragmentation. <laughs> I agree with you and uncertainty. On the other hand, there's this incredible capacity to play with your own image and your own presentation of self. That certainly was not my reality as a young person. I don't know what that's doing to people because I think those two things pull against one another. You know, you have all this whole thing about um, everyone has the, what is it? Everyone's a fraud. I forget what they call it, but everyone, you know, uh, everyone feels like they're, um, you know, they're masquerading uh, in the world as like a put together person that they otherwise don't feel. So there's this incredible tension between the lived sense of fragmentation and the capacity to create an image that provokes all kinds of responses. <laughs> you know, if you want them and if you go kind of get them either on social media or in the world itself. Mm -hmm. um, I've been trying to figure out what it is to be a Zoom uh, phone analyst. Mm -hmm. And I feel like very old fashioned in so far as I'm very worried about it. Um, I mean, at the same time, the work carries on. I don't have a sense that I'm not, that the analyses aren't happening. But 
I feel dead. I can't be on Zoom phone call and phone calls all day long, eight hours a day. I miss the patients, I miss their bodies, I miss like greeting them, I miss being in the room with them. It just doesn't feel the same. I'm not hearing from them the difference yet. You know, um, I do like the, the feeling that I don't exist somehow, which is always some, it's, it's always a presence in the analysis, like who the fuck are you? And like, like, are you even real? And I just talk to you and then I leave. And like, what even is this? It's this kind of feeling that you have to carry that the analysis, the analysis is carried through that feeling. Um, this feels fragile for some patients, like really that you could just disappear. You know, like that the, the next time they'll, they'll call you on the phone, you won't be there, you never existed. And the kind of terror of that um, loss mm. I think is, is very present because of the, the media. Mm. Um, I mean, my experience in the hospital, however, was very real. <laughs> I mean, that was, that was real. That was like body sickness, death. But can I just a quick follow up on that, uh, on the, the change? In, in the actual therapeutics setting and, and your interaction with patients. So how about yourself? I mean, because I, I, I think, I don't know if I've read this recently or I, I listened to an, a recent interview that you gave that you talked about loneliness, the, the loneliness of the analyst. Um, and I'm thinking, you know, with Zoom, like we, we talk a lot about how there's this weird thing where we look at ourselves in, it's like a mirror, right? Like we, we it's impossible not to look at yourself when you do a Zoom call, apparently. Um, so I wonder how that works in, a, in the context of talking with a, a patient. I mean, my choice is between being like a disembodied floating voice or being stuck with the image. And also, by the way, analysis is not this staring at each other's faces. I mean, if you think about it, you say hello to your patients, and even if they sit across from you, you don't get to just see, you don't see the person's face in the way that you see it on the Zoom. And I think that the kind of face-to-face -face, um, really does something different that, you know, in, in terms of reading the cues that the other person's understanding you, following what you're saying, getting caught in that kind of feedback loop of understanding is what I really worry about, about this, like, face-to-face -face thing. Mm -hmm. um, the other funny thing that we mentioned was that patients now can see the clock and end the session themselves. So they're absolutely aware of the time. When they see it click, they're like, okay, thank you, goodbye. <laughs> they, they hit an end. So like, I don't have my tools, which is to one, you know, make you leave the clock, and two, I end the session, which is very important. So it's, it's a, this is a very strange new reality. I don't think we know what, what's happening. What, what allows you to retain your faith and fidelity to the method in this moment? What is, what is the hope that it gives you for not only transforming patients, but also creating some sort of broader transformation as well? I mean, this is the, the Lacanian in me is that the signifier and it's like kind of anarchic, unconscious potential to like break through all of this stuff. I still feel it there. You know, the patient still has a dream and something strange happens and I hear it and I catch it and it moves into a new direction. And, and I think, you know, thank God. <laughs> thank God this is still happening. So, I mean, really, that's the, that's the only thing. And it's the same, actually, for me with the, um, the social media and the internet is um, people are wildly funny on the internet. It's what I mean, I, you know, I can get lost in Reddit and all kinds of things online, you know, Instagram, because I really enjoy people's, like, quit quick wit and humor. And there's, a, there's a, a kind of playing with what the internet does in terms of speed and also contingency, because everyone's, you know, picking up on like tiny contingencies and moving them all around amongst each other. And uh, I love that. I mean, I, I feel like it's, for me, deeply psychoanalytic. Just, I had a, had a question there on the, about the future, I suppose, and uh, the way you see uh, the role of, of psychoanalysis um, going forward. 
And I was going to sort of ask a slight, slight provocative question because I know it's not something that we have talked about in the past. Uh, do you see uh, digital astrology as a possible sort of competitor, um, you know, maybe uh, the, the field losing um, followers to digital astrology, the co-star and the like? Or text therapy. <laughs> There's this thing called Talkspace now, even though it has some bad press that it has like zero confidentiality whatsoever. Um, I mean, look, psychoanalysis, I think, is very fragile in the world, period. I think it always has been. I think it should remain so, actually, because the moment in which it had any hegemonic power, it was a disaster. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, this is the moment when psychoanalysis said that gay people are pathological and, you know, it could analyze everything to death and like it didn't matter what you had to say to them. They already knew everything already. Um, so I don't mind its fragility and I don't mind all the competitors. I do think that the, the I worry that because analysis asks a lot of you. It asks a lot of you in terms of tolerating anxiety. Um, and forcing you into speech and loneliness when you're already lonely, because it's very lonely on the couch speaking to someone who doesn't necessarily answer you back when you want them to. Um, and it asks you to tolerate uh, uncomfortableness in terms of going deeper and deeper into your own discomfort. And that seems like it's very at odds with what these apps are <laughs> providing, <laughs> especially the astrology apps which give you the grid that everyone thought psychoanalysis was gonna give you for understanding other people and predicting the future. Um, so, you know, the question is gonna be when people reach the limit of that, which they will reach. I mean, I have faith in that. This is not gonna, it's not gonna suture the wound. Then they're gonna to have to come back to the analyst, which is fine. We'll be there on the side alone. <laughs> <laughs> with our computers probably <laughs> I think what's what's really uh, just a, a very quick follow up on this I don't want to uh, this to become a conversation about uh, about astrology apps but I think for me interestingly they seem to be taking a leap out of the analysts book because in recent the way they evolve I think it's the the they seem to be less about giving you the map and the forecast the prediction and more about doing something about how okay let's accept we can't really give you that and let's engage in some sort of darkness and cynical space together and um, so, uh, so some of them seem to be taking that route which is a kind of a new version that i think is quite interesting so I don't like the over determination the like the like you know oh today you know the next two weeks are going to be terrible so just deal with that that like that kind of thing yeah yeah, that and the kind of these prompts that they sent you that, that you know, that they can be quite um, even aggressive or negative that, you know, today is not, today is going to be right off for you, forget it, that kind of thing. So, so you have a Scorpio moon, so you're really just an aggressive person and you'll always be like this. So, you know, try to control yourself. Yeah, yeah, that's it. <laughs> but the thing is, is that it's still predictive and it's still a grid. It takes a different form. It's not like, you know, in two weeks time, you will have a windfall mm -hmm. um, and you'll meet the love of your life. But it still gives you this orienting kind of grid for understanding and for moving into the future. Mm -hmm. uh, I, you know, I just think you can't sell people optimism in that sort of old astrological vein. So you have to, you have to darken it <laughs> a little bit so that they can move with it in times like this. Mm -hmm. We're back to make America great again. <laughs> <laughs> How you sell optimism in its darkest possible form? Um, I wonder. I wonder if um, I wanted to ask you, as, as someone who is a, a practicing analyst, if you noticed. You already mentioned a, a couple of times, but I wanted to open it up again. Shifts generationally, because you know this podcast is really motivated by the the inquiry that Aris and I are doing into what gets framed as the epidemic of mental ill health or the epidemic of anxiety on university campuses and both being university professors and, and dealing with us on the front line in some way with almost no training how to deal with it, we, we sort of began to pursue this project. And you know one of the arguments we come up against quite a bit is a, either a hyperpathologization or a hypopathologization of this generation that either they're like, 
incredibly sensitive and overly uh, determined by their emotions and anxieties, or nothing's new at all. It's just a different discourse on the same old packaging. What, what's your sense of that, of this youngest generation um, and, and what they're going through and whether it's qualitatively or even quantitatively different than what other generations have gone through? Um, I would say both. And the reason I would say both is because I don't like the, um, you know, oh, these, the new people, they're so bad, they're so crazy. I, but I think there's a new package on it, which is that they have been handed this language of mental illness, which screens like very old pathologies in a way. Um, so the question is their identification with it and what that does to them. Um, the one thing that I do think is new, um, it's not entirely new, to be honest, but um, that I do see is that the, the kids are suicidal. Um, I think that there's a huge increase in suicidality. I know that they've linked it to the rise of social media, um, but I, as an analyst and an analyst who sees kids and who sees adolescents and who sees young adults, do see something at the very important place of adolescence. So adolescence is a very special moment in which your whole body is rearranged along with everything that you have to kind of push of your past into an image for your future because you need to find some resting ground and moving from child boy and girl to an image of what it means to be a woman or man in the world. And this bodily upheaval requires you to put some signifiers in place so that you can move forward. And the kids that I see don't, can't kind of put those in place and they collapse completely. So there's this kind of pre-adolescence insanity where they become suicidal because there's nothing to catch them. And for whatever reason, this is the worst for little girls because you know this is the like 600% increase in suicidality amongst like 11 to 13 year old girls. Um, and I, you know, that everyone's saying, what does this have to do with social media? But if you don't have, if your parents and the world can't provide you with the signifiers of what it means to be a woman, and then you're left with what social media hands you, which is not very pretty at the end of the day, and in which women are discardable, um, I really think that it's a sinkhole. That may also be true, I think, for example, for um, white men and the way that that's making them incredibly suicidal and opioid addicted, that they have no idea what it means to be a man in this world anymore, and then probably a variety of other people. Um, so, you know, it's not that people haven't ended up in this impasse before, but it seems to be happening to a very, very extreme extent. And it also has something to do with the fact that people speak openly now about being suicidal with one another on the social media and then get reinforcement with it on top of it. So the little girls that I've treated, they say like, I'm suicidal. And the other one goes, yeah, I am too. And then they get into this kind of affective contagion and reinforcement about it. It was something that you might have kept more private and lived with and suffered with. And then when you venture to speak, um, someone might take you more seriously in a way, whereas on the internet, it's kind of diffused and encouraged um, without giving it any grounding. Um, so this is where I would say that I, I worry about what is happening for the younger kind of generation. And not to, not to encourage uh, conflict between the different uh, approaches to this, but I, it strikes me that the that methods that are indebted to the psychoanalytic tradition would have quite a different approach to this than some of the other methods that uh, are on offer for for professional help for these issues. Um, you were mentioning before that, uh, yeah, in, in some some diagnostic practices the the or a treatment practices, I should say, the diagnosis is the goal in some way, that you figure out the diagnosis and you've written quite eloquently and, and provocatively on, on the reliance that we have on drugs to fix these problems. So I'm curious in this, in this moment, um, like what is, what is the promise and importance of psychoanalytic methods compared to many of the other forms of psychiatric or uh, psychological help that are on offer? 
I mean, because we listen very, very carefully and try to pull out from the child and from the family what, what, what this child has inherited <laughs> for better and for worse so that they can, they can orient themselves to what their predicament is. Um, you know, you are the daughter of this mother and this father whose, whose mother and father, you know, have passed down to you this problem in a world that you feel is like this. I mean, if you just tell someone that they're depressed, it doesn't provide them with anything. And then you give them medication and you make them feel like, you know, they're just defective and need this drug because they have what? This thing that you just labeled. So, I mean, and I don't know who, who else would do this than a psychoanalyst is the problem. And I really worry about the other therapies in this regard. Um, you know, I mean, the, it's funny because Eris is making this joke about the competitors on the internet. I mean, at least the astrology gives you this sense of the world <laughs> and your birthday. <laughs> no, but I, I mean that. I mean, actually, when I listen to patients talk to me about astrology, they're really searching for like what, what, what they were given. You know, like what, what lineage do they have? What, what is their predicament? You know, even if it's the moon in Scorpio and the Venus in Uranus or whatever, at least they feel like they've been handed something that they then can tactile manipulate. Whereas, what do you do with depression? You medicate it and then you're supposed to feel better. And that's all that's, that's, all that's, that's left for you. Mm. So it breaks my heart. I mean, really. And also, like, I just like, why are we giving kids drugs? Yeah, yeah. And, and I guess in the university context, what the, the sort of um, approaches that Max and I, and I'm sure, you know, in your experience as well, what we encounter as mental health support services tend to be very much around the sort of CBT, uh, you know, six sessions and you're out um, kind of approach, right? Which again, I'm not sure how much it breaks that cycle that we're discussing here. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm aware that we, we're coming towards the end of this. So, Max, I, I don't know, did you have any, any final question? I think we covered, um, it's been wonderful talking to you, James, and I, I hope that, um, yeah, that this, this was, um, I don't know, I don't know if, if uh, our perspective was, you know, capitalism and anxiety, but I think, you know, we, we took some interesting uh, turns in our, in our conversation. No, I think it's the, I think you guys are asking a really important question. And I, um, I think being part of a community of the anxious and then asking a question of how you get out of this is the right, is the right one, but you have to do it with other people. It's, it's really important. Mm. Um, and people who are prepared, I think, to listen, which is also what both of you are doing. Yeah. I think this is a good uh, point to um, come to an end. Uh, so, Jameson, thank you again for your time and for joining uh, joining us in this episode. So, um, if you're interested in Jameson's work, you can find out more about it in our website and the links that we're going to put on it. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you both. Such a fascinating conversation with with Jameson, um, and it's so nice, I think, for us to have a conversation with somebody who is um, a clinician and a practitioner, uh, someone who has a lot of sort of on the ground uh, experience with these issues. That for us, even though of course you and I deal with uh, the anxiety of students practically on a daily basis as teachers um, or custodians of the university space we still experience as a somewhat of an interruption whereas it's you know her her bread and butter so to speak i guess i wanted to pick up with one thing that we discussed in um that interview which is the curious way in which uh mental illness especially as it is organized that discourse is organized around a set of diagnoses begins to proceed online through spaces that might at first appear to be or claim to be about mutual aid. So I think what we've seen, and as we were discussing in our last episode with Anna, who did the research for our projects on UK universities, uh, we see that students and other people who are suffering 
uh, are increasingly using digital tools of social media in order to find one another, to understand their common predicament, to offer advice, to offer support, um, but that this might not be as rosy as we would hope. I mean, of course, on some level, it represents a very promising um, movement that takes people out of the hands of the medical establishment. It takes people, it allows people to make their own meaning of their own, uh, their own realities, their own existences. Um, it allows for them to have an impact on the discourse that controls them um, as people who suffer from this thing we call mental ill health. Uh, and so all of that's good, and, and often those communities provide a literal lifeline to people who otherwise might be having suicidal ideation, et cetera, et cetera. And yet, as Jameson points out, there's a number of reasons that we should be very cautious about these. I mean, one of them, as she noted in her discussion around um, uh, girls and suicidal ideation, that these suicidal ideations can contribute to one another uh, and, and develop a whole set of discourses around it, which actually make it harder to spot the moment when that ideation, which is not uncommon in young people, uh, tips over into actual suicidal intent and, and action. But more generally than that, it, uh, I, what I wanted to draw out from what she said is that in another way, uh, these, these online groups are often organized around the categories of diagnoses uh, quite uncritically. So for instance, it would take anxiety as it's diagnosed by the kind of medical pharmaceutical um, psychiatric field for granted and simply say, well, all of those of us who suffer this type of anxiety or that type of anxiety are now going to go over to our chat room here and compare notes and provide support for one another. And what there, there's sort of two problems here um, that, that I see based on what she was saying. On the one hand, this reifies or makes a reality out of a discursive formation. We know, and I think in our conversation with Nicholas Rose several uh, weeks ago, he made the strong argument that most of our categories of psych of mental ill health are the creations of a biomedical discourse that does not necessarily help all the time. Sometimes it segments things into very clear diagnostic categories that in fact don't match the reality and the complexity of human existence and the way that mental ill health in various ways overlaps and is complex and is idiosyncratic to each individual. So on the one hand, you have this sense that, aha, now we know anxiety, we know depression, we know obsessive compulsive disorder. These are quote unquote real um, categories and we're not going to question them. We're just going to find support within them. And that has the effect of reifying them. The second problem though, is that then it, it lacks the thing that I think Jameson finds in psychoanalysis, which is the exploration of what's underneath these, uh, what are understood to be psychopathologies or mental illnesses. And without looking at what's underneath them, both in terms of for the individual, but also in terms of the society that gives rise to mental ill health, we have a much harder time in confronting these underlying causes. Um, and that these spaces can be affirmative without being transformative. They can affirm one's experience of suffering, but they don't actually give one necessarily the tools to transcend that suffering. And in fact, can sometimes do the opposite, can contribute to a kind of negative feedback loop where the affirmation of one another's experience of anxiety, of depression, et cetera, et cetera, actually creates a reality from which one has a very difficult time emerging. Yeah. Um, and I don't have much to say beyond that other than to note how ambivalently I feel, because of course, on the one hand, I see these groups as a way in which people are resisting power in our society. On the other, I am very worried that both in, in these groups specifically and in society in general, we're moving away from ways of thinking and talking about what transformation would actually look like rather than coping, rather than just coping with the situation in which we find ourselves, whether that's a psychological situation or, as we were talking about in this discussion, a political and sociological situation as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, had, I was thinking along very similar lines, Max, and uh, really I was struck by the uh, Jameson discussion of the, this young teenager group of girls and the severity of the problems that they're faced with in their involvement in these online spaces that you were just talking about, which, just, yeah, it struck me as that, that is a kind of age group 
uh, that we haven't really sort of considered in our own exploration and investigation of how young people, university students, tend to use those, those forums. But it made me think also about the role of analysis as a sort of the, the politic as a political tool or as a um, as a tool with which to engage in that kind of new, very fast paced uh, reality that is mediated by social media. And so what is the answer that analysis psychoanalysis can offer? Uh, and I think, as Jameson said, it is about listening. And as you just said, it's about that additional depth, the nuance and the kind of unpicking those layers and digging beneath. But also, I think it's about something else, too, which um, can be very generative. And that is the fact that analysis engages with strangeness and with, the, with darkness and with the ambivalence and with fragility. And it exposes it rather than covers it up or, or promises a sense of control. And so in that sense, I think it does something very useful in training societies possibly potentially to engage with the darkness that's around them in, in, a, in a more generative and emancipatory way. Uh, and I think there's something specific about, so then the question for me, the interesting question that arises out of this conversation is, what do we do with that dialectic between the speed, the, the, the fastness of the world that we inhabit and the slowness required for that listening and that introspection and engagement with fragility and ambivalence? How, how do we then maybe, if you like, repurpose the tool that psychoanalysis offers us for engaging with that kind of dialectic in a more productive way? I don't have an answer, but I think it's a very interesting um, point of departure maybe for, uh, for, for further thinking. Um, so I guess we can draw things to, uh, to an end here at this point. And, um, so it's this episode was produced by me uh, and uh, Max Haven uh, with the support of Reimagining Value Action Lab and the Institute for Advanced Studies at University College London. Until next time, it's goodbye from me. And we'll see you next time.